what conversion engine should one use is also variable. As per uh, the recommendations, the unit should be mentioned as nanogram per ml when we have a growth hormone values, and it can be used as standard uh, unit in assessing growth hormone values. It brings us to a condition or a concept of priming. What is priming? During puberty, the sex steroids increase and augment growth hormone release. So when we suspect a child who has growth hormone deficiency, giving sex steroids a few days prior to testing will increase the growth hormone response and help us to differentiate a condition which is physiological from a growth hormone deficient condition. Also, priming diagnoses physiological condition and prevents unnecessary use of growth hormone therapy. Whom should you prime? All the children in peripubertal age group or patients who have bone age more than 10 years should be primed before doing a growth hormone stimulation test. How should priming be done? In boys, priming is done by giving injection of testosterone, 100 milligrams, three days prior to test testing, or one can use oral ethylestradiol in the dose of 20 micrograms, three days prior to testing. Testo ultimately gets converted to ethylestradiol, and hence we can use ethylestradiol as a priming agent in males as well. For girls, we use ethylestradiol in the dose of 50 to 100 micrograms, three days prior to, prior to priming. This is an example of a patient who was referred to us with growth hormone deficiency. The lab reports done outside showed a value of less than three nanogra nano, uh, nanograms per ml. The patient did not meet the clinical criteria oxygenologically, and hence we did a repeat growth hormone stimulation test after priming. And the results were like this. The values were much about 10, and this patient did not have growth hormone deficiency. So priming does help us to diagnose a growth hormone deficient condition from a physiological variation. This is how one would approach a patient with growth hormone stimulation test. If you do a growth hormone stimulation test, which are normal, the patient either is normal or has neurosecretory dysfunction. What does this mean? This means that the patient has low levels of growth hormone in the body, low amplitude and low frequency of release, but if we do a stimulation test, the levels come as normal. These patients ultimately will need growth hormone therapy when we are managing them. So these patients have to be followed up regularly. So the stimulation tests are normal. The patient is either normal or has neurosecretary dysfunction and needs close follow-up. If the patient shows poor response to the test, one or two depending upon the clinical judgment, he has growth hormone deficiency. Now it could be a isolated deficiency or MPHD which requires confirmation by doing a CT or MRI, and if possible, one can do a molecular, molecular genetic testing. If the patient shows high basal, as well as stimulated values of growth hormone, this patient has growth hormone insensitivity. So we're dealing with a patient here of either Laron syndrome, or for that matter, IGF-1 genetic defects, which can be diagnosed by doing a IGF-1 generation test or molecular genetic testing if available. When the patient is on growth hormone therapy, what do we monitor? The patient has to be followed up very closely, preferably by a pediatric endocrinologist every three to six months. We look for the growth response in the form of change of height by calculating the Z-scores. One can monitor IGF-1 and BP3 levels. Now these IGF-1 and BP3 levels are surrogate markers of growth hormone levels. They help us to diagnose the response to the growth hormone therapy and also help us to adjust the dose of growth hormone depending upon the IGF-1 levels. One has to evaluate the patient for compliance and also look for presence of adverse effects, if any. Would IGF-1 be an ideal surrogate marker for diagnosing growth hormone deficiency? The literature search says that yes, IGF-1 and BP-3 can be useful to analyze the safety and compliance of this, but they always do not correlate with the growth response. So IGF-1 is not the ideal surrogate marker for diagnosing growth hormone deficiency. They can basically be used for analyzing compliance and adjustment of dose, but may not be helping in diagnosis of growth hormone deficiency. Papers which was presented by Dr. Khadilkar and his team also show that IGF-1 levels in Indian children 
may not be a good indicator for monitoring growth hormone response in the general population. So basically this was what uh, we as pediatricians do in growth hormone deficiency. I'm going to briefly cover something about congenital lateral hyperplasia, not essentially the clinical aspects, but lab parameters in patients with CH. This is a basic uh, understanding of the HPA axis. Hypothalamus releases, releases corticotropin releasing hormone, which acts as anti to cause release of ACTH from the adrenal cortex. The cortisol levels have a negative feedback on the anti as well as the hypothalamus. What is CH? It is basically a lot of types, but basically it is produced because of partial or total loss of function of 21 hydroxylase deficiency or CYP21A gene, which causes loss of negative feedback by the cortisol levels on the adrenals. Therefore, it causes increased ACTS secretion leading to adrenal hyperplasia. A standard size slide to show the serotonin pathway. Cholesterol gets converted to aldosterone, cortisol, and testosterone through a lot of interme intermediate metabolites. Now there are various hormones which, are, which have to have a role to play in conversion of one product to the other. If there's a deficiency of them, the commonest being 21 hydroxy deficiency, then cortisol or 11 d hydroxy cortisol is not formed, and here aldosterone is not formed, but it causes increase in the 17 OHP levels. And the entire pathway is now directed towards the testosterone pathway leading to increase in <coughs> testosterone levels. So 17 OHP levels will help us in diagnosing CH in the, in the lab parameters. How would the child present to us? The child will present to us with virulation of external genitalia, especially in the females, decrease cortisol leading to adicinian crisis, leading mineral, decreased mineral corticoids leading to salt wasting. How fast? Will the clinical signs come to picture after birth? The biochemical changes require about two to three weeks to manifest depending upon the severity of the phenotype. Failure to thrive and other non-specific symptoms take about a couple of weeks more to manifest. Clinically, the, the lab-wise, the patient will have hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, hypoglycemia, along with shock-like features with metabolic acidosis. As we already seen, the diagnosis of CNS, uh, CH is based on levels of 17 OHP. They obviously are going to be increased in patients of CH. Normal neonates have values of less than 15 nanomoles per liter, but in cases of non, uh, most cases of CH, we have values of between 300 to 800 nanomoles per liter. Now conditions like non-classical CH have marginally increased values and hence would require stimulation test to confirm the diagnosis of non-classical CH. This is uh, just to show you that the classical CH with salt vesters will have significantly high values of 17 OHP. They may be higher, but not as high as classical in patients who have simple virulizing features. That means they have clinical features, but no lab parameters at presentation as compared to the other forms of CH.